Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everyone on this beautiful Saturday? Welcome to another live with uh, me, conversations with me. So the main reason why I wanted to start doing these way back in the day was to allow people to really kind of go my personality outside of me on um, playing the instrument and to answer questions that you may have about the industry, questions you may have about guitar, questions that you may just have randomly about music. Um, I want to try to be of uh, of service in any way possible that I possibly can. Like if I can give you some insight, maybe you didn't think about this or maybe you didn't know about that. I just want to be able to kind of be uh, a well of knowledge, you know, as much information as I've gathered over the years. So good morning, Walter. How you doing? I definitely wanted to uh to to provide that information. So excuse excuse all this. We all know it's like COVID nineteen. Ain't nobody. Well, I can't say ain't nobody, but most are not um getting their haircuts and their face done. So oh man, most you guys are welcome. For those that have been giving me um, a lot of love for the overdrive video, I understand that everybody, a lot of people have different personal preferences when it comes to overdrive, but for years. When I first started playing, I used to battle with trying to get a good tone and didn't I know how to do it. So that the reason for that video was to really kind of give an overview of how you can, you can everybody can tweak it at their own, but it's about um, really just showing you like the nuances of how to massage overall general, how you can get a good overdrive tone and then you can do whatever it's necessary in order for you to get it. Um, favorite guitar player of all time. I don't have a favorite guitar player of all time, but I definitely have a lot of guys that I like. Um, I would start with Spanky Alfred. Um, I like Walls. I like Jubu Smith. I like Agape Jerry. I like Lachaz Holloway. I like Tim Stewart. I like Mark Letiri. I like some of your greats, your classics, like your Steve Ray Vaughan, Jimi Hendrix, um, Wes Montgomery, and, you know, stuff of that, that nature. Nerdy Tunes. I still watch that because of you. Oh, man, appreciate it. Love and blessings, love and blessings. Any tips on songwriting? Yes. So when it comes to songwriting, you want to make sure that the chord progressions are simple enough to where like a songwriter can write over them, like easy melodies, nothing too complex or too hard or complicated. Um, you want to find things that go together. So keep it simple. And then like whatever melodies you hear in your head, you want to try to play a chords that support those melodies. Um, thanks for the video. I want to learn the fretboard in the most effective way related to R and B. What's something I can practice every day that I that I can be better at? Um, <clears throat> I would tell you. Um, I just put this disclaimer out there: if you guys are eighteen years or younger, definitely ask your parents before you go to my website. But if you're older than eighteen, if you're really trying to learn the fretboard and you really want somebody, it's easier when you have somebody who knows um, how to play and knows exactly what they're doing to teach you. So I, I highly encourage you to go to Carriage Camp. Dot com that is k-e-r-r-y-s k-a-m-p.com and i have courses that literally spell it out and show you exactly how you need to learn the fretboard so the way you can become um, proficient and knowledgeable about what you're playing is it possible to get a modest income on playing guitar right now no <laughs> ain't nobody making no money I can't even say ain't nobody. Limited people are not making money by touring. But yes, if you um, if you plan accordingly, if you work your craft, I know people who are not necessarily like playing for larger name artists that are making a living. I know some people that do gigs three sixty five days a year or at least two hundred to three hundred shows that do like jazz types of situation or R and B. Just depending on how you market yourself, it's all about marketing. Really, however you. You, uh, you're a brand, so if you brand yourself in order to be successful, in order to make money, then yes, you can definitely do it. Um, it's more than doable. I've seen a lot of people do it. Um, I encourage most musicians or guitarists that want to do this, realizing that like it's not all about playing for big name artists. That can get you into trouble because you're thinking that, oh man, if I play for a Rihanna, or if I play for um, a Beyonce, then I'm gonna be straight. They don't tour all the time. They have families, so they do different situations. So I, I, you know, I talk about this having a contingency or having some other streams of income, so that way that you can offset whenever you're not working. So it's just about being smart, and it's not that you can't do it, but it's being smart about how you go about doing it. 
That was a great question. Any advice on recording acoustic guitar? So it just depends. Um, if you're recording acoustic, there are some guitars that go direct that do really well. It's about levels. So I would say like, you know, controlling your levels and then trying to make sure your guitar doesn't sound like super sharp, like it's high pitch in the, in the mix, or there's no mids, or there's bottoms. So it's really about making the adjustments. Or if you have a mic, mic placement. Um, I've done records where I played acoustic where I've been mic'd. I've done acoustic records where I've been, I've done, done direct. So it's all about um, really getting the EQ right. Once you get the EQ right, and then not being so aggressive. If you're aggressive or you're an aggressive strummer, then lower the volume. If you're not an aggressive strummer, maybe bump the volume up just a little bit, but like not too hot. You know what I mean? So that's what I would say. That's, that's the trick to playing a uh, recording acoustic. Oh man, somebody's starting to camp next week. That's what's up. That's what's up, Calvin. Welcome to the family, man. Welcome to the family. Uh, thanks for the overdrive video. I have two overdrive pedals. I was struggling with the tone, but now much. Oh man, thanks. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. What else? What else? I just signed up for Carrie's camp a few days ago. Been loving the content, man. I appreciate it. Like that's what I'm saying. Like I. Carrie's Camp is my baby. That's my passion project. That's what I really put like my life and my soul into. Um, because I, I realized what it felt like being the other guy wanting to have a place and an outlet to get information and get really valuable kind of stuff and couldn't get it. So like I'm at a place where like that's what my focus is, is building a, a you know, a platform where you can just really get everything you need. I almost want to give you too much information. So it was just like you're not looking at like, man, I wish I could learn this. I wish I could learn this. I wanted to be like, it's so much. It's almost like an information overload where you can be like, you know what? There's a lot of information. Let me take my time and decide what I want to go through. All right, let's go back and let's look at some of these other ones. I saw all the different courses on your website. Is this just the camp that has the trial to do it? It says, or do any of the others have trials? <clears throat> the flagship is Carrie's camp. That's the flagship. The other stuff, if you sign up to Carrie's Camp, you're, the other stuff is bonuses. So you're going to have access to those as well. But Carrie's Camp is the flagship. That's what it is. So you're going to try that out. You know what I'm saying? And once you gain access to that, you get all the other stuff are bonuses, like all the other courses that I offer, the acoustic course, the beginner R&B course, the gospel course. All of those are bonuses. The video chord library, the lick library. I'm showing you how to play licks. I'm showing you the chords that you use. That stuff that you're not going to get from a book, you're not going to get from most sites. And I'm not trying to like, you know, throw shade or whatever, but I'm saying I really have studied. I've worked with my team. We've built something to where we can really feel, feel proud about it and we can really stick our chest out and be like, yo, this is the site. This is this is the site that's all sites. And, you know, and most people will try to like, you know, try to duplicate it, but there's only one. I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. There's only one. All right, what's the best order to learn the chords? It's overwhelming trying to remember them all. Take one chord at a time. That's the best way to learn. Take one chord at a time. Learn a C chord. Learn how to play C so many different ways on the different necks of the position. Of the, then you go down, all right, what's the next chord? C sharp. Or if you want to start at the beginning of the neck of the guitar, learn B flat. Learn all the positions of B flat. Learn how to play a, a B flat major, a B flat minor, then go to B and then continue to just modulate. So like what you would do is take it a chord at a time. Don't try to be like, let me learn all these chords. And what I teach all my students is learning the chord shapes, major shapes and minor shapes. That's over half the battle, like major shapes and minor shapes. And then it's just about learning the positions of where they are. But you already know the shapes. So learn the shapes. All right, let me go back. There's some really good questions this morning. All right, a part of your gospel court, uh, guitar guard guide, I'm, I've been thinking about joining Carrie's Camp. Um, is enrollment open? Yeah, enrollment is open. So all you need to do is go to carriescamp.com. Mind you, if you're 18 years and younger, ask your parents first. But if you're of age, go to carriescamp.com. That is K-E-R-R-Y-S-K-A-M-P.com. And you can sign up. All right, I've been practicing on more of my bar chords. Fingers are getting more stronger, especially the index finger. Thanks, Carrie. Been creating progressions using bar chords, studying note on the fretboard. That's what it's, that's what it's all about. I love hearing and I love saying that. Love from the UK. What's up? What's up, Dan? Apart from Overdrive, what pedals do you recommend for modern R and B? All right, so these are the pedals that I recommend for modern R and B. You need to have a tuner, number one, so that you can always be in tune. I suggest having a good reverb pedal, having a good delay pedal. 
and then just overdrive. Those are like, for me, I like to play with a volume, so I'm not trying to push that on anybody else. You may not be comfortable with a volume pedal, but if you like, if you know how to use a volume pedal, if you're really comfortable with it, I suggest using a volume pedal. Those are the pedals that I would say that you can do any R&B gig. All right. Bro, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule every week to chat with us. I feel like you don't get the thanks. Oh, man, I appreciate that, Taylor. Appreciate that, Taylor. All right. You said stack overdrives on the Helix. What's your approach to on me, on the ME80, just got to the camp. This is on the ME80, this is on your approach on the ME80, just got it cause of you in the camp. So if you're a part of the camp, right? And you're using the ME80, I've done an extensive video to show you how I use the ME80. So I would suggest going to the search tab at the top, type in ME80 so that way you can get access to that video that shows you exactly how I use the ME80. I'm talking about the patches that I use, how I use the volume swells, everything. So on the ME80, so if you're already a member of Carrie's Camp, go in there, search for the, um, the ME80, it'll pop up, it'll populate, and there you see the video. It'll walk you step by step on how to use the ME80. I think ME80 is a great board, but the thing about it is if you don't know how to use it, it's just a random board. All right, let's go back in here. All right, too smooth. It said you have tried the Bias FX2 or Bias Amps. No, I haven't tried it. I don't I don't know anything about that. I haven't tried it. I carry hope you're fine. What does your Line 6 rig setup? You have to be a member of Carry Scam for me to tell you exactly about my Line 6 setup. So if you're not a member, I cannot give you I can't give you the holy grail. I can't tell you exactly what I'm doing. And then also I'm always tweaking my stuff. So like it may be set up like this for like this period of time, depending on what artist I was working with or if it was a session, I'm generally changing my stuff out, but I have a base of what it is. But if you're a member of Carrie's Camp, I let those people know exactly what I'm using. Hey man, thanks for the lesson. I started with the blues. Now R&B is really a challenge. I noticed the keys are different than the chords played in the song. Can you explain? The keys are different than the chords that are played? I that never, I've never heard of that before. So there is no challenge. I, I tell you what it is, it's, it's probably a level of how you approach your understanding of knowing what's going on, right? That's why I always teach the major system. Like I teach like the major skill so you understand the number system. Reason is that the formula that I use or the formula that I teach you so that way you understand, you have an understanding exactly what you're doing. So it sounds like you're, you may be confused with what's going on, but the keys and the chords should always line up. It, that doesn't make sense to me. So I would tell you to go back, reassess, or if you're, you're not familiar with the number system, you're not familiar with learning like the major scale, I would tell you to sign up to Carrie's Camp. You need somebody that's going to be able to show you exactly how to do that so the way you can play without any restrictions. All right. Three channels I watch on YouTube is Juno, Travis Calvin, teaches gospel. He's a guitarist from Mississippi. You, Juno, Travis Calvin. Man, that's what's up. I'm just glad to be in the mix. I'm glad to be in the number. You know what I'm saying? Do you come up with two smooth parts of your name? No, I didn't come up with it. Somebody else gave me that nickname and it just stuck. It was just something that stuck from my childhood. And I just, I used it as a marketing brand um, when I became, um, well, I didn't even, not say even when I became, even now I was going with my craft. I'll tell you how I came up with the idea and the concept. I was working with this guitarist from my hometown and he was like, how can you differentiate differentiate yourself like from any other guitars, right? He was like, you're a brand. You got to think about a brand like McDonald's. We know that they're a brand. Coke, we know it's a brand. BMW, we know it's a brand. But if nobody knows you, how do we know you're a brand? So I have the same name as a, a famous painter in my hometown, Kerry Marshall. So when you would Google Kerry Marshall, when I first started playing, a painter from Birmingham would, po would populate. And I was like, that's not going to work. Because people would think like, or do you paint? People would ask me all the time back in the day, do you paint? I'm like, I'm not a painter. And so I Googled the name and I was like, okay, cool. I got to start doing something to differentiate myself from this painter. So that's when I started using my nickname, Too Smooth. So that when, I, when you Google me or you populated my name, it would come up as guitar player or guitars. It would come up as me versus the person that painted from my hometown. 
what's your most influential album? I don't have a most influential album. That's not, that was never a thing for me. What I, what I liked was I liked various things um, growing up, you know, uh, growing up in a church household and in a kind of religious household. Um, gospel music was big for me. So growing up, quartet music was a big thing. That's why I started to gravitate towards groups like Tony, Tony, Tony. It gave me that same kind of feel. People like D'Angelo that gave me that same kind of feel. And then R&B slowly but surely started to creep up because, again, it was just, it had enough of the elements that kind of gave me like that gospel feel. But I love just the chord progressions because they were, they were different from gospel. I really appreciate you giving us guitar players um, who are not as cold as you. Thanks. Man, that's what it's all about. See, listen, it, I'm not about like, you know, holding the information. I'm about giving it back because I know what it feels like to not have somebody give you information especially or take out the time i, I want to take out the time and really just pour into you guys as much as possible because i want to see you grow and i want to see you flourish you know i, I want to look up one day and you know, i'm watching the grammys and i'm hearing a lick and i'll be like yo that that sounds like something i did i think that would be super dope that's the reason why i'm doing this stuff to just empower the next generation of guitar players what's up bro we suggest buying a lesson from Sound Slice or the care the camp, the Sound Slice, that stuff is like, it's just a package. It's very small, like, it's a package. It's like a pick, right? Carrie's Camp is like going to the, to the guitar center. You get everything that you want. Would you rather just get a pick or would you get access to everything? I suggest going to the camp. Would you say, who would you say are the top five guitar players today that you're aware of me <laughs> i don't know man that's a that's such a generic question i don't i don't even know that you can rank because it's not like we have a it's not where like in the nba you could be like oh this person is better than this person so it's really it's really like it's uh it's personal preference it's really what you like so yeah that's how i answer that question what advice would you give a person to develop their musical their musical slash artist concept. Thanks for all the info, by the way. Your great channel from Portugal. What advice would you give a person to develop their musical slash artist concepts? I would tell you, make sure you connect with your audience. Listen to your audience, whatever they say, right? If they're giving you feedback about things that you can get better, start applying those principles. Don't, like, you got to have thick skin in this business if you're really trying to, like, um, be more musical and appeal to like as an artist. You got to listen to the artist and then you got to be true to yourself. If you know that that's not who you are, try to be true to yourself. Try to be as authentic as possible. That way people can connect to that versus you trying to put on a facade of who you are. Hey, Carrie, have you started very rarely play arch tops, semi hollow bodies or hollow body guitars? Could you share your experience with them? When I used to play arch tops or semi hollow bodies or, or hollow bodies, that was only when I was in my jazz phase. Like I have uh, a few guitars now, but those are mainly for like when I'm doing recordings. I only use them for recordings. I don't use them live because I don't like the feedback that I get um, because a lot of them feedback and it's just like, I can't use them on stage because they're howling the whole night and it's just very frustrating. And also a lot of them don't have locking tuners on the back. And that's really important for me because as most people know, I play with a tremolo bar. I do a lot of vibrato. I do a lot of slides. I do a lot of bends. And I need the guitar to stay in tune. So that's the reason why I don't really play. And it doesn't fit the general music that I'm playing right now for R&B. Now, if I'm playing jazz, then I definitely want to try to be as authentic as possible. So I use those guitars for those jazz gigs. All right. Let me go back and look at some of these. What's up, Carrie? Are you still doing the gospel guitar camp? It was never a camp, it was a series. So it's still happening, the series is still happening. Um, I just uploaded um, some new tracks for people to work out to. Um, it's, it was just a series, it's not a continuation, it was just a series. Hey Carrie, do you have a particular exercise you do to work on groove precision in your rhythm? Guitar playing? No, I don't have a particular exercise. Like the thing that I'm always trying to think about is, is like, I work on the feel of a song, right? So ghost notes. So um, I'll give you an example, right? So if I'm playing like some ghost notes, let me lower this so you guys can see what I'm doing. 
So let's like, say if I'm doing some ghost notes right stuff, I'm like, like that, like kind of palm muting, like that stuff underneath. Like that whole like tick -tick -tick -tick, like that rhythm underneath. That's what I'm working on. I'm working on that rhythm. I have to make it feel. If it does not feel good to me, then it's not gonna feel good to the audience. It's not gonna feel good to the artist. It's not about me playing the 50 million notes. That phase of my career is over with. Like when I first started playing, I wanted to try to like, oh man, I could do all these different notes. That that doesn't pay the bills. That's not gonna get you a gig. That's not gonna sustain you. That's not gonna have you coming back to get hired. Those guys that do it, I think it's awesome. I love it. Like it looks cool, but that's not like that's not music to me. So that phase for me, I've let that go. It's all about the groove, establishing the groove. Like just me playing that a few minutes ago. Like if you were just listening to it, you were like, oh man, it makes you rock. And that's what I want to work on. So I'm working on the stuff that you don't hear in the song. That ghost note. I'm thinking about a percussionist. If he has like a little shaker and he's playing like a bongo. So I'm thinking about being that. I have to be all of that. So that's what I work on every day. If I want to work on being a good rhythm player, a solid rhythm player. And then I don't want to get too fancy. There are a lot of times in my career, I used to try to get too fancy. And I've had artists be like, yo, what are you doing? And like, and luckily they, they pull me to the side and, and talk to me. But had I been playing for some other people, I would have got fired. So I learned that you can, it's not about being fancy, it's about being consistent. Find those consistent chords that feel really good. And you're playing for the artists that you're playing behind. You're not playing for the few musicians that are in the room because most of your audience that listens to you, they're not super, they're not musicians, they're not super musical. They just know what feels good. They know the song they heard when they bought the CD or they bought, they downloaded the album. They know what it feels like. So if you're up here trying to be too flashy, too fancy, that's not gonna work because they're not familiar. They're like, what song are you playing? I don't know that song. So you wanna stay in the pocket, stay as groovy as, groovy as possible. That's what you wanna work on. All right, hey man, when I search for the Boston. Okay, so Supreme, this is what you need to do. Email support at carry2smooth.com. It's there. We have already talked to my staff. It's, it's there. So I don't know. They'll send you the link specifically where it's at. They'll tell you how to find it, but it's there. What is the first thing a beginner should learn? How to hold a guitar. That's the very first thing. You can't play if you don't know how to hold a guitar. How to hold a guitar, learn the parts of the guitar, learn about a pick, find out what's, you know, what kind of strings you like. You need to figure out the, the equipment first before you start playing. Now, if you want to start playing, then I would tell you, you should start learning chords because you have to get your fingers to form different kind of shapes. I'm not throwing up gang signs. I'm just saying like how to hold bar chords or do whatever. And then from there, I would start learning scales. So chords and then scales. Like I will try to work on them simultaneously, right? So let's just say learning how to play a G chord, right? And then learning how to do a G scale at the same time. Like so chord first, then do a scale. That's what I would say if you're a beginner. I right, do R&B players use alternate tuning or mainly 440. I can't talk about anybody else but myself. I'm 440. I don't use that alternate tuning. I don't like it. It's it's called standard tuning for a reason, and that's what I I do not like when people use alternate tunings. It just frustrates me because that's not. That's not how I grew up. That's not how I grew up playing. It's just like yo, it's it's standard tuning. You got to just play it. So I know some people are trying to be different and trying to like, I tune down to E flat. Whatever they do, that's what they do. Not what I do, it's completely different. Hey Carrie, your videos are always great. Was wondering what neo soul slash gospel song to start out on. There's nothing I would say um, gospel I would say start out on. Neo soul I wouldn't even say. I would say a great song to start out on if you're really trying to learn how to play is Get Gone by Ideal. It's it's got good chords, blunt, and it's got a lick. Da, 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 da. It's it's got a good lick. It's just enough meat of everything when you're first learning how to play that will keep you in tune. It's got some hammer on stuff in there, so it's good. It's a good song to work on. Um, what type of strings do you use? 
Uh, the strings that I use, I use um, D'Addario's Tins. It's like a orange, it's like a blue pack, but it's got orange writing. That's what I use. Any live performances or album you recommend digging into for, impro for imp improving? Oh, improvising. Uh, uh, it just depends on how musical you are. I would say listen to Snarky Puppy. That, that stuff that they do when they're doing their solos, it's all, it's all improvising. So I would say that. Is a jazz master a suitable guitar to play R&B? Yes, a jazz master is suitable for playing R&B. The last tour that I did with Keanu Lede, I used my jazz master for the whole gig. It's definitely suitable. Um, but again, what I would tell you to do is like, you want to be keen on listening to tones. Don't use a guitar or buy a guitar just because it looks cool. Oh, I got me a jazz master. Da, da, da. Don't buy a guitar just because it looks cool. If it cannot sound what you need it to sound like, let it go. You know what I'm saying? It's not, it's not worth it. So I wouldn't invest that money. I use a jazz master. I had to change out the pickups because I, I liked the pickups, but they weren't. They didn't give me the kind of presence that I needed. So you may have to do that as well. Which artists have you performed with on tour? Let's go down the list. Uh, Lettucey, Chrisette Michelle, um, Shantae Moore, Kiana Lede. Uh, I've worked with Tori Kelly. I've worked with V Bozeman. I've worked with Ty Dolla Sign. I've worked with 2 Chains. I've worked with Jason Derulo. I've worked with... Uh, I mean that's enough. I can't I can't think about everybody else. That's enough. That's enough for today. Which guitar made you which guitar is made for RB? There I'm mean, honestly, I can't say which guitar is made for RB. Which guitars can you use for RB? I'm a huge fan of the strat. I like the strat, the HSS setup configuration. PRS is nice. Um, Les Pauls are nice. Tellies are nice. I feel like those are some good guitars for like R and B. Let's see what the, do you practice with a metronome? Yes, I practice with a metronome. Do I practice all the time with a metronome? No, because sometimes I'm using it as my creative space where I'm just trying to create. And I have a pretty good internal metronome. Like I count when I'm playing one, two, three. I'm tapping my foot when I'm playing, you know what I'm saying? So I got a good meter already. So I don't have to use a metronome all the time. And I'm always recording for a lot of times. So like I'm always, hey man, can you play on this record? Or can you send me some guitar loops or something like that? So I'm, I'm, I'm always working on my meter. Supreme Gaming, did you uh, did you get that? So Supreme Gaming, I would say email support at carrytoosmooth.com and ask them exactly where the video is and they will show you exactly where that video is because I don't want you to miss out on that. How can a guitarist become better at soloing? And how was it when you first began to solo? All right, so a, a guitarist can become better at soloing a couple different ways, right? You need to sit with somebody that can show you exactly what to do. I tell people all the time, especially when I, I'm teaching in Carrie's camp, um, it's about playing the melody. Now, if you don't, let's say you just have a brain fart, knowing where the relative minor is, like knowing where the six is of, of whatever key you're in, you can just dig out notes. And it's about phrasing, right? So you want to make sure that you make the guitar have conversations. You don't want to just be like, um, let me see if I can give you an example. So, so like if I'm playing a melody, like I can play that basic, but I want to put a little bit more on it. Like the trills. I'm having a conversation, right? Like I'm having a conversation. Like I'm not, it's not about trying to wow you with 50 million notes. I'm really, I'm playing in the key of C major, but I'm doing a lot of stuff off of that minor pentatonic. Picking out certain little melodies, like 
The thing about what I tell people when it comes to soloing, <clears throat> it depends on if you're playing a song that people know, play the melody because the audience is already gonna know where you're gonna go from there. And it's about adding a little something here and there. You don't have to wow them with 50,000 notes. Those days are gone because most of the audience cannot digest it unless you're playing jazz. If you're doing improvisation for jazz, that's a different conversation. Like if you're doing jazz fusion, that's another conversation. But if you're just playing like an R&B type of solo or just solo in general, play what people know, play the song. That's the best way in order to learn how to solo. If you're having a brain fart, then go to the relative minor. So that it gives you some ideas of how to like pick out some notes. And it's your job as a guitar player to make words with those notes. Those are just random notes, random like letters. It's your job to formulate those letters together to make words, to make a sentence. Do you use reverb with delay at the same time? Reverb is always on for me. Um, delay is not always on. There's every now and then when it, like the song calls for it or the moment in the song or in the music calls for it, then I will step on delay, but reverb stays on the entire time for me. Um, I, I like to have that presence. I don't like my chords to be dry. I like them to be wet and kind of fill out the room a little bit. Okay, you've helped change my entire sound. Thanks so much. That's what's up, John. That's what it's all about. What are the questions? I wanted to thank you, man, because of you, I started taking guitar seriously. I appreciate that. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. I want to show people that, honestly, that everybody can play. Everybody can play. It's not, this thing is not so complicated that, that nobody can do it. I wanna show you that like, if you use a certain kind of tips and then you apply some of the principles, I'm not saying that I'm the only teacher that's out there in the world, but I definitely wanna share a lot of information so the way you can be equipped to be able to play whatever you wanna play. Um, is there a transparent distortion you would recommend? All right, so if you're going to buy a stomp box, I'm a huge fan of the Keeley D&M pedal. Um, if you're kind of starting out, you're not really sure, you don't want to spend that much money, I would say the um, Full Tone OCD is a great pedal. Um, or the Vertex um, Dynamic is a great overdrive pedal. I would suggest those. Those have really good tones. I've used those pedals. Um, I'm currently using the Keeley pedal now, and I, I stack it up against anybody. see some other things all right so we got any more questions any more things i want to make sure i'm trying to get everything um who are your favorite three guitar players right now my favorite three would be eric walls um i love the stuff that jubu's doing and i would say isaiah sharkey i would say hi carrie i think you miss mine on the beginner guitar what, what question did you have on the beginner guitar? I wanna make sure I, I'm getting that. So if you could just say what your question is. It says, when you do a two, five, one progression, what factors in when you're, what factors in where you place the other chords in the song? So let's just say a two, five, one, right? So let's say I'm in G, right? Two, five. That's like your basic. So what I'm thinking of, if I'm playing, it just depends on how the song is going. So I'm like. I might go to six. So I might do a sus four. Two. Five. One. I'm using the chords that are in the scale. So again, I'm using the two, five. So I might do seven. Then I might go to that three. Back to the four. It's all about using the numbers and switching the numbers around. So I would not necessarily do a two, five, one change. That's not a progression that I would normally do if I was playing a song or writing a song. But if you happen to do a two, five, one, play, throw the numbers around, kind of switch the numbers around. Fender Swire or Ibanez, Telly or Stratocaster for beginners. 
whatever you can afford. Honestly, if you if you want to spend the money to get a Strat, I would say get a Strat. If you want to spend the money to start out with a Squire, Squire is good. I highly wouldn't suggest an Ibanez. I'm not a huge fan of Ibanez um, for R&B, but it just depends on what you want to do. PRS is the best. Uh, yeah, they make some great quality instruments. I wouldn't say that they are the best, but they they there's some great quality instruments. I've played PRS for a very long time. Now my main go-to guitars are like I've got a, a LSL um, Satikoi and I've got a Fender Strat that I feel like are like my favorite tones right now. How many opportunities? How many opportunities come around? that require you to be a multi inter So for me, because that's not what I do, I haven't had to do that. But do I see a lot of like, I don't see I see a lot. I see gigs that come up that require or ask, you know, like certain outlets will be like, yo, we're looking for a multi-instrumentalist or we're looking for a person to be able to sing and play and run this at the same time. There's There are some, some niche gigs like that. Um, and every gig is not, this is one thing I need people to understand too. Every gig is at a different level, right? Every gig is not a, with a household name, but sometimes those house, those names that are not household names work more than the household names. So it just depends on what you want to do. It may be an artist that we've never heard of, but it's an artist that may have you literally all over the world and you're working all the time. So yeah, there are some gigs like that. I necessarily don't go for those gigs because that's not really what I'm trying to do or what I was trying to do. I really wanted to play for a name that if I said, oh, I'm playing for Jason Derulo, everybody for the most part would know exactly who I was saying. And that's what my priority was. So I really didn't look out for those other gigs. But do I see every now, every now and then come across my email? Yeah, I see them every now and then. Thank you, Carrie, for sharing. Oh, man, love from the UK. Definitely. Really appreciate your knowledge. I appreciate that. How old were you when you first started and how much did you practice? When I first started, I was 11. And how much did I practice? Honestly, um, as much as my parents would allow me because they used to tell me like, boy, shut up, you're making too much noise. So I practiced as much as my parents would let me. And I wasn't good. I wasn't one of these child prodigies that came out was I was blazing. No, I had to work, <laughs> work super hard. And a lot of people didn't take time out with me. A lot of people were just like, whatever. Like, whatever. he ain't got it. And just kind of like, I won't say like wrote me off, but it was just like, I wasn't their priority. So I had to work at it really hard. It says, how did you like playing with another guitarist, Big Mike Hart in particular? Man, Big Mike, that's the homie, man. I, I loved it, man. Like anytime Mike would call me, like if he needed me to support him, I would support him. I, I mean, the last concert that we had, like I played behind him on stage. Mike is super talented. He's super skillful. And the thing about what happens when you start to play with another guitarist that's like at that level, it's about a mutual respect, right? So I'm not trying to be like, I'm not trying to step in his way. He's not trying to step in my way. We learn to compliment each other on stage. And when you hear the sound, it's just like, wow, man, that stuff sounds great versus like, man, it sounds like they were battling on stage. How did you get work with um, big artists? So for me, I had to move to LA. And then when I got to LA, I had to network and then I had to sub for a lot of gigs. So I subbed at a lot of church gigs, right? And I would go to like different live uh, jam sessions and I would send in a jam session so people would, they would hear my sound and like be like, oh, okay, cool, cool. How long you been here in the city? And I would just network and be like, yo, if you ever need a sub when you go on tour, I'll play your church gig or whatever. And my first call to go out with a major artist, I was actually at a small Baptist church playing bass. I wasn't even playing guitar. The organ player that was at the church knew I played guitar. So we were like, you know, back and forth, talk about like me, my, my guitar chops. The drummer was the actual MD for Tyrese. And he was like, what are you doing next Thursday? And I was like, man, I'm not doing nothing. You, he said, do you want to go to St. Kitts? And I'm like, yeah, I never knew. I never heard of St. Kitts before a day in my life. And I'm like, yo, who are we going with? He was like, Tyrese. And like, mind you, he never heard me play guitar, didn't know me, did only knew me as a bass player. And I wasn't like that the most blazingest bass player. I, I played the notes, I played whatever was required for the song. He was like, yo, rehearsal is next week. It's like a 14 hour day rehearsal. Can, like, can you be there? I'm like, yeah, bet did that. And then from the Tyrese gig, I used that to kind of promote myself and start showcasing because once here, you get here and you start to network and people start to see you out, then they automatically, not automatically, they, they assume that like, there's gotta be a certain level that you're, you're coming in at, so. You start to get more calls and more opportunities. Please go back and explain 
chords in that two, five, one in G. So two, five, one, right? If I'm in G, right? The two chord is going to be that A minor. The five is going to be that D. But instead of me playing like a D major, I like to play nines. I'm playing a nine and then I go back to that one, which is the G, right? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to that seven, which is that F sharp minor 11. Then I'm gonna go to that three, like that Jimmy Hendrix chord, that B, and then, so two, five, one, so. what I did and what I'm starting to do the more I start to play it I start to work on voicings right so instead of me playing like the, the minor 11 my index finger down I'm taking it up that changes the tonality of that chord right so we're hearing that -na -na -na. now I'm going -na -na -na. Na -na -na. that's the joy of when you start to play with chords you start to get like really comfortable start working on the voicings of chords, you're getting the meat of the chord, you're getting the meat of the notes, but now I'm taking like little nuances, little notes out here and there. And like, that's almost like a jazz kind of thing. But the thing about, I tell people, when you're playing, the more comfortable you get with the guitar, instead of you start to play the same chords all the time, start to experiment, start to see what chords, what notes you could take out of chords and still capture the essence. Now, if it doesn't rub the right way, the, if the, you know what I'm saying, like the contrast is a little bit too much, then don't play it. If it doesn't fit, then don't play it. When you moved to LA, was music your main gig? Yeah, I moved to LA only to pay music. I didn't move to LA to do anything else. I had no other side jobs. I didn't do anything else. Um, I moved to LA just to play music. The thing is I saved money for over a year. So I had money saved up because I knew moving to a new city where nobody knows you is gonna take time for you to build your brand and to build your name. So I had money saved up for a year. I had been saving and saving and saving and saving before I started to go out there and be like, oh, I'm gonna just try it. I was smart. <laughs> if I didn't have any money saved up, man, I would have struggled. I would have been like six months and I gotta move back. What's good, Caleb, what's good? All right. Do you still practice those sweet hammer-ons with chords? Or do you have a practice routine with them? No, I don't practice them. I, I just play them. And that's not because I, I'm at a different... So the thing, what people got to understand is my playing and where I'm at, I'm at a different level than what I teach. So I'm, I'm teaching people how to do it, but I don't necessarily have to do it every day because that's not something that I'm focused on. I'm not focusing on like the hammer-ons. I'm focusing on when I song right. I get a lot more calls now now that I've kind of transitioned in my career, um, I'm getting more calls of like, we need you to play chords on this song or we need you to write this song. So I'm not trying to do hammer-ons all the time. I'm thinking about chord progressions and how they work to build this picture. That's what I'm focusing on. That's my my thing that I'm focusing on. What other, what other thing? Um, I watched your video on the cage system. So you're pretty much saying the cage puts restrictions on learning chords. For, so. Crystal, what I'm saying when it comes to that, I'm saying like for the cage system is restrictive in the sense of it doesn't allow you to fully play, in my opinion, R&B the way that I teach. The the soulfulness, the the ability to do the slides or whatever. A cage system is just a system. Everything, everybody has a system that they like. I don't like the cage system because it doesn't necessarily allow me to play the way that I play. But if it works for you, it works for you. All right, another question. What other question? Greetings from the Dominican. What's up, what's up? All right, one more question is, is how do you, how does the business side of production work with credits and with getting royalties and whatnot? All right, this is the last question I'm gonna answer uh, for today's session. So when it comes to that, you have something called a split sheet. So either you work with whatever artist that you're working with, whatever producer. So if there's there's a production side of the house and then there's a, a lyrics, like a songwriter side of the house. So if all you did was production, if it was just you, then you would be 100%, which is like still 50% because it's like 50 and 50 make 100. That's how you make a whole song, right? So either you or how many ever people like produce a song, then you talk about the splits, like, Okay, your percentage would be like 
let's say you did 5% of the song, let's say I did like 40% of the song, somebody else did whatever percent of the song, a force of production, same thing would happen with the writer side, right? And so you would have to either register with like um, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. So when you register the song, whoever the particular person is, you would get credit for it. What happens is, depending on how many revolutions happen with the song or whatever, that's how your royalties are calculated, depending on how many streams, how many record sales, how many whatever. And what happens is depending on whatever service you with, that person will cut you a check. Now you have different kind of companies that will like help you get your royalties, but you have to register with one of those platforms, either ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. That's the only way that you can keep track. Or, or they may just be like, you know what? If you're a guitarist and you didn't actually produce a song, you just played on the song, they may give you a flat rate. Or they may just say like, yo, I want to give you a credit. And the credit might be just like guitar guitar work by such and such. And you may not get anything. So it just depends on how you work that situation with whoever you're deciding to do the song with. All right. Well, that's it for this Saturday. Hope you guys tune in next Saturday. I love you guys. This has been great. We want to continue to keep doing this thing. For those that are brand new to this channel, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to this channel and click the bell so you're notified when we're dropping heat because we're always dropping heat. We're dropping nuggets, okay? Um, for those that are 18 years and older, I mean 18 years and younger, and you haven't like you haven't talked to your parents, but talk to your parents first, and you're looking to try to really expand your guitar playing, I suggest going to my website, carriescamp.com. We are really changing lives for guitar players. If you can go back and read the comments and see what people are saying, you know that this stuff is really working. So it's K-E-R-R-Y-S kamp.com. If you're 18 years or older, go to that site now. That's what you're designed to do to really play. So I can show you how to really unlock the fretboard and really play to your full potential. All right. Love, peace, and hair grease. Happy Saturday, and I'll talk to you guys later.